Okay. I just got an article. Actually, I got it yesterday. I didn't really want to comment on this article, but because it was written by a Yale professor, I figured I better share some insights in regards to what this uh, man said. The headline is, Jesus was crucified because disciples were armed, Bible analyst suggests, or Bible analysis suggests. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll come to this paragraph here, and it says, The biblical books of Mark and Luke both state that at least one, and probably two or more, of Jesus' followers was carrying a sword when Jesus was arrested shortly after the Last Supper. Now, first of all, using the word probably suggests the one using it is trying to convince you, the reader, of something he was unable to research or even prove. So he wants to actually convince you by his own lack of understanding. And it has always confused me. Why is it so many people believe preachers that use words like that? Like, you know, like probably or perhaps or maybe or could be when they preach, especially when they preach prophecy. It's amazing. And I also have to ask how this man can even claim to be a Bible analyst while ignoring how to analyze simple words in Scripture. For example, in Luke twenty two thirty eight, it says, And they said, you know, the apostles talking to Jesus, they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. If you properly analyze the word sword here, you find it is not a sword that is to be used in battle. In fact, in the Strong's Concordance, we find the following. It comes from the word makaria, which is Greek for sword. And it's number 3162 in the Strong's Concordance. And the basic or main definition is a large knife used for killing animals and cutting up flesh. If this man was a true Bible analyst and not someone who appears to be an advocate for gun control, he would know that words have different meanings today, especially words used long ago. This is often how Satan gets the less educated to misunderstand simple scripture. Many words that were used 2,000 years ago, and even words used to translate the King James a few hundred years later, don't have the same definition today. In fact, living in society today confirms this is a fact many times over. I mean, most of us have already witnessed this with our own eyes. For example, the word cool used to mean cold to the touch, right? But in the 1950s, it meant some guy wearing a leather jacket who was a leader or a popular teenager in his high school that other kids looked up to. Not too long ago after that, the word bad no longer meant bad. It now means something was to be considered great or powerful in the eyes of the one using the term bad. Or take the word gay for another bold example of how easy it is to show how words can change their meanings. Not too long ago, the word gay meant happy and giddy. Today, it means homosexual. This means the so-called Bible analyst is not actually a true analyst at all. Had he been one, he would know you cannot define doctrine or even simple Bible verses written thousands of years ago and then translated into Old English many hundreds of years later to still have the same definition today. That's just basic theology 101, but this guy is a Yale professor. Another way to confirm this Bible analyst is not to be trusted is the fact that Jesus himself said the two swords presented by the 12 apostles in Luke 22 was enough. Now, if they were weapons, as this so-called Bible analyst claims, then Jesus would have said to the 12 apostles that they needed to go get 10 more swords because they only presented two. You cannot arm an army of 12 men with two swords. I mean, are they going to take turns using the swords in each battle? But since the true definition of the sword was to be used in cooking or preparing meat for meals, Two swords for 12 men was plenty for making those meals. Still, some may balk at that reality and wonder why Jesus was even asking them to have the swords in the first place. While reading that section in Luke 22 in context, we see the truth rather clearly. It says this, verses 35 to 38. It says, And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse... Let him take it. And likewise his scrip, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. Jesus knew he was about to be arrested and then crucified for our sins. He also knew that the apostles would no longer find friendly believers as they would soon be traveling from town to town without Jesus. 
beforehand when Jesus had been walking with these apostles and all the people for those three and a half years, many clamored to their sides to bless them with lodging and meals and even clothing, as the reference to buying shoes intimates. They had no need of anything because thousands of people came from all walks of life to be with Jesus. But now they're going to be going from city to city, spreading the good news without Jesus physically by their sides. And that would mean not everybody's going to be receptive to them. So now they may have to cook and even buy things on occasion just to survive. Hence the need for scrip, shoes, and two swords for cooking. One last thing. For this so-called Bible analyst to claim Jesus was killed because he and his followers had weapons is blasphemous, to say the least. He, Jesus, was killed for our sins. To say otherwise is to declare what he did on Calvary for all of mankind was a lie. That fact alone proves this so-called Bible analyst is actually a non-believer at best. I actually looked into the man that made this claim. Check it out. He is a professor of religious studies at Yale University. And if you check out his bio here on this page, it looks like a who's who in the sexual perversion community. His many books and articles on all sorts of gender-specific sexual topics suggests he's not one that's going to want to uplift Bible Christianity, but one that's going to want to uplift Roman Catholicism instead. Problem here is not many people are going to want to look into the many evil works of this man after reading his demonic doctrines in this particular article. So if you run across anybody that knows of this article and they want basic understanding of what's actually happening here, please share with them this video. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. God bless.